So, um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the future of ambient communication and ambient technologies. And I'm going to explain what those are in a minute. Um, I come from a research institute in Palo Alto, which is called Institute for the Future. So the content you're going to see here today comes from the research work we do every year. We have several topics we do research on. We do research on the future of technology, the internet, so that's what I'm going to do here today. But we also research on the future of the human being, healthcare, well-being, and the global ecosystem, both politically, socially, and economically. Uh, today, essentially, I'm going to give you a highlight, a summary of the recent researches we have done on the future of the internet and the future of technology, and in particular, uh, talk about the early days of artificial intelligence, where it comes from, how it's modifying how our organizations and uh, some new things that are appearing like virtual assistants and then I'm going to talk to you about the future of the internet and some things that are going to happen into, into this future. But I'm going to start back in history and I'm going to start from this thing called the difference engine. So the difference engine was invented by this guy whose name was Charles Babbage. So Babbage was essentially uh, a scientist, a mathematician, living in the Industrial Revolution in England. And Babbage invented this machine here, which is precisely called the difference engine. And this is somehow the first calculator that was invented. Mind you, this is a huge object. You, you cannot fit it in your pocket. It was used for the first time to solve mathematical problems, essentially. Okay, so Babbage, inventor of the calculator. But Babbage did something else as well. He wrote this book, which is not very well known, but it's a book that for the first time puts in relationship uh, numerical calculus aided by this machine and the production in factories, because as you know, in the Industrial Revolution, we saw the first examples of, of factories. So he used, he began to study methods to optimize production and use mathematical calculus to optimize production in factories, enhance organization, and enhance the whole factory production. This was one of the first cases of trying to apply numerical calculus to optimization. And this guy here is a lot of years after, uh, is Herbert Simon, who invented a piece of software in the 50s called Logic Theorist. Logic Theorist uh, is mentioned here because it can be considered as somehow the first piece of software that can be called something similar to artificial intelligence. It's the origin of artificial intelligence, okay? Probably the first implemented AI program. And mind you, it was originally written on a piece of paper and it was presented, uh, I think, in 19, yeah, 1956. From these two historical moments, we are at this point here today. How many of you know this painting by any chance? Have you seen it before? Nobody? Good. This painting is not actually a real painting in the sense that there is no human hand behind this. But this is the result of something done by a machine, or better, a series of technologies put together. In this project, which is called the next Rembrandt, some algorithms of machine learning, machine vision techniques, and other technologies have been used to study all the paintings of the life of Rembrandt and synthesize the techniques, the use of color, the lights, the, the, the characters he would portray, the clothing, and every, essentially everything that would define a Rembrandt painting. Then, through 3D printing techniques, using the same color pigments that Rembrandt would use at the time, 
some uh, a range, uh, an array of 3D printers started printing this painting here, which in theory is what could have been a next painting done by Rembrandt. Okay? This was sponsored by ING in Holland and is today in the Rembrandt Museum. Today there are different types of artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, there is one huge artificial intelligence, there is machine learning, different types of machine learning, and here to, to make this painting, a lot of them have been used, put together. We are facing today what I like to define a new kind of automation. We are collecting data uh, and, and, in, in, and formatting it in digital format since essentially the 50s. Okay, when computers starting, calculus starting to appear in the offices. And talking about business data, we have collected essentially data for the last 70 years, more or less. In, all, in, in those 70 years, we've been through different stages where we invented techniques to optimize businesses, we invented marketing, we invented a lot of things. One of the things we invented is enterprise resource planning. And enterprise resource planning, which is essentially is the optimization of processes, takes inspiration exactly from the original idea of Babbage back at the time in his book, when he firstly put in relationship calculus and production. So we went through the year of enterprise resource planning. If you remember, we used to call the, the management software ERP. Now it's a term you don't hear so often anymore, perhaps. But ERP is really the ERP softwares that are out there, and I'm just mentioning some of them out here, I'm not doing advertising, it's just to show you there are many brands out there that have ERPs. An ERP software in a company essentially contains all the data of the processes of the company. Today, in a, in a large corporation, the software that runs it, that's behind it, contains all the data about how the corporation works. So we're going really, we're here facing a shift. We're going from the age of ERP, where we started to essentially digitize uh, enterprises, to the era of software-defined organizations. And why do we call it this way? Because in the software that today we use in every large organization is the essence of how the organization works. The software knows more about the organization than the people that work in it because it can base its knowledge on 70 years of data, okay, in most cases. Software-defined organizations, though, are not just the, the current, the, the human organizations, but they are also entirely digital new forms of organizations. And I'm talking about these terms here, DC, DAC, DAO, DCOs. These are digital autonomous corporations, digital autonomous organizations, and digital collaborative organizations. These are all terminologies to define new web entities, algorithms that autonomously perform activities relating data, relating devices, services, machines. And they constantly, autonomously perform activities on web. They're regulated in some cases by smart contracts or by technologies like the blockchain. These are essentially the first types of companies that run by themselves. They can run by themselves because they can base their activity on previous data and on artificial intelligence. We have new types of organizations, new types of digital organizations, and we have new types of assistants, virtual assistants. And mind you, these are not just the ones you see today on the phones. I'm talking about the future of virtual assistants and how they will evolve. This is a scheme showing you more or less how the evolution of virtual assistant will happen. It starts in 2017 with smart objects. In 2017, we are 
in the beginning, I would say, even though it started a long time before the, the design part, but we are in the beginning of the Internet of Things. We are essentially placing connectivity into objects, okay, and the Internet is starting to become physical. So we are creating, in 2018, we start creating smart objects. We start seeing smart objects around us, okay. Then we also began seeing uh, self-driving systems, like the Google car, for example or any other autonomous driving system. It, it's the same concept evolving, okay? We're also starting to see virtual assistants. In those years, large corporations are adopting artificial intelligence-based brand ambassadors and virtual assistants to do things like customer care, assist their, their users, their shoppers in, in shops in, in, in different situations. But these virtual assistants that are today essentially mainly applied to retail customer care and on your phones, you know, for Siri and all the others, they will become our virtual coaches because they will learn and they will know information about ourselves and they will find patterns about the way we behave, we live, we work, patterns that we don't even know. So our machines, we start actually knowing ourselves better than we do. They say not hard to do, but they will start becoming our coaches because they will know if we are prepared or not to perform a task. They are able to call upon knowledge for us if we need to know something before performing a certain job. Okay, and they will start constantly teaching us things to enhance our capabilities. Then the next phase will be negotiation. Virtual assistants will be so smart and so knowledgeable about ourselves to be able to negotiate things instead of ourselves. So for example, they would know that I have a telephone subscription, I have, I'm paying a rent, I'm paying some services, and it could constantly scout the internet for better offers, but then it won't, will not ask me if I want to change my provider because it's cheaper. It could just switch service into a different provider for me because it's better for my profile, because it's cheaper, because it can offer me more, okay? So it's another form, remember the title before, a new kind of automation, okay? It's an automation that happens Passes by, knowing our, passes by knowing ourselves through data and becoming a true negotiator for everything we do. One example of that's nearer of what virtual assistants will do for us is in shopping. We will have a virtual assistant expert in every type of item. Every brand will have their ambassadors in digital form. And they will be present on our phone as holograms in shops, in an airport when you travel, in different forms everywhere around us. Remember the title of this presentation today is, is the future of ambient technology. We begin to understand why we call them ambient, because technology is starting to be around us. It's not anymore confined on a screen, but it starts assuming the shape of a virtual assistant projected in a space, you can have other uh, uh, data around it, around the physical world with augmented reality, and you can build immersive spaces with virtual reality. At this point, some faces usually go like this, but don't worry, you can always hire a virtual assistant to help you out. We're really facing here a new era, which is called the era of ambient computing. It's a new age of computing. We are adding one dimension to technology and the internet. It's the 3D. It's the third dimension which enables technology to jump out from the screens and become real, surround us, okay? Or as real as real. And this starts, again, a little bit of history. This starts in the 60s, imagine. When you say technology is exponential, everything changes fast, wait a second. It takes some years before we adopt it. 
Imagine virtual reality was invented in the 1960s. It's starting to be used today, 70 years, 60 years after. Okay? So Paul Barron is one of the founders of the Institute for the Future. And in the 60s, he made this drawing on a piece of paper at the Institute. This became kind of famous because it's the theory of going from centralized to decentralized to distributed systems, information systems. Why am I telling you this now? Because what is happening today in computer all depends by all depends from this evolution. Centralized systems generated mass media and mass experiences. We call them, you know, large people, a lot of people connected to the same experience. Of course, television is the best example of mass experiences, an emitter and receivers, many receivers spread around the world. The internet, on the other hand, was born out of a different type of paradigm of information systems. It's based on decentralized information systems and it originates a new type of media experience which is the social experience. This Social networks are really born out of decentralized systems. Now we have a new paradigm that's coming out. Actually, we already live in it. And it's the paradigm that's generating ambient experiences. This is the distributed information systems. And why do we call them distributed? Precisely because the computing units are distributed around the planet, not only the internet, but today also physical objects, excuse me, that are present in our physical world. That's why we call it the Internet of Things. Ambient experiences are a different form of experiences. We don't sit still and watch a screen. We participate most of the time with others in experiences that are around us. This, these people here are running after this guy. Okay, it's a Pokemon. I'm sure you know you've heard of Pokemon Go, the game, augmented reality. Okay? Groups of people flooding the streets and cities looking for objects and for, for uh, characters that do not even exist. Okay? So ambient technologies are so powerful that even though they're not really existing in, in the physical world, the digital elements that belong to another world, they're starting to influence the real world, big time, and the physical world. I mean, all these people were flooding in the cities, that even in cities that they had some cities that had circulation problems after that. So we are facing a new concept here. So media is no longer a part of the environment. Media is the environment. Okay? And pin that, because brands and your lives too in the future will be inside a highly mediatic context and you will be surrounded by media, data, computing and technology. What will happen after the IoT? We, we said we began making smart objects recently, uh, but we, the IoT really began by connecting objects. First we had Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, but objects were not really smart. Okay, so we started connecting objects and, the, and then because technology became cheaper and, and we were able to shrink components and make them smaller and smaller, we were also able to make objects smarter and smarter. So this Internet of Things today that is made of connected objects, semi-intelligent connected objects, is becoming more and more intelligent as we go along. And we defined the next internet era as Internet of Actions, IOA. Internet of Actions comes from the Internet of Things because it's made of the same type of objects we initially just connected that became smarter in time, were upgraded, and that started to interact among themselves to generate new services or to run existing services. Think about transportation and autonomous vehicles. Okay? Uh, uh, 
a high number of coordinated items, smart coordinated items that act in the physical world, the Internet of Actions. What happens in this Internet of Actions? Uh, there are four main new things that happen in the Internet of Actions. The first one is that we can alter human perception. And, well, I go, I go through them like this, so you see them all. So we say the Internet of Action is really reconfiguring reality because by adding digital elements onto reality and by creating all these super intelligent objects that move around and interact, we are essentially modifying the way our reality works. We started doing that already, but it will happen more and more in the future. So one of the things that the Internet of Actions will do is will enable us to alter human perception in ways that were not possible before. Altering human perception means you can easily imagine how easy it is with augmented reality to make you see something that does not really exist, like I showed you before. But we're seeing already today what uh, things like fake news on social, social networks can do. They are already powerful forms of persuasion. And we are already altering the human perception with, with uh, information bubbles in the internet, with fake news. So imagine if just with a tweet, which is made typically of a few words, if you can do so much, influence crowds with, with you know, such short messages. Imagine if you had this, this power of immersive ambient media where you could alter the perception of people in any environment. There are different things you're, you will be able to do in this sense. You will be able to immerse people in technology spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. You will be able to illuminate new patterns in between relationships and relations in, in between people. So to offer them new types of services, for example. Of course, you'll be able to control more people, get more data from them, and influence their decisions. That's why we call this altering human perception. The second thing that happens, we have four, remember, uh, is called encoding human activity. And I had to show this at this point. So this is a pretty typical device for human activity. But what happens if we make this device smart? We can have this. We could have a global map of body data, of health data, of any type of data coming from people's bodies. And this could be tremendously helpful for, for the medical community, for example, not just to offer products. Okay? So it changes perspective, and so encoding human activity does mean, in a sense, it's getting new data on how humans do things, but also it means teaching machines by encoding human values into machines, teaching machines what being human means and what our values are, so that machines can be better servicing us. We are able to embed technology in anything, to execute any task, rebalance and remix technology and content in any way we want. The third thing, this is fun, manipulate matter. The Internet of Actions and the new technologies in bioengineering, for example, will allow us to literally manipulate matter and change the status of materials. Why do we say that? Because, for example, <coughs> we know that already a company like Autodesk, which is the company building, uh, producing the CAD software, is building, is working in, in their labs on a new generation of software to design that starts from a molecular modeler, as you can see here. So designers of the future will not just design products by their shapes and colors, 
but they will be able to interact with the molecular composition of materials, hence changing the status and the dynamics, reactions, behaviors of every product. And by the way, this new generation of products built this way will be, as you can see on the right, not just objects, but they will be more and more similar, similar to organisms. Okay? Whether they be living or non-living, that's a different thing. Okay. So about modeling matter, there are the following things you'll be able to do. Model, model matter as I've shown you. Make new things, print on demand things everywhere you are. And you have these two new uh, strategies, which is swarm and root. They both come from computers, from the internet. Swarm is gathering entities together and making them move in a group. For example, a smart dust or nanotechnologies that move all together million, millions of single units. And root, be able to root smart objects anywhere to perform tasks, like drones on demand, for example. Finally, the four, fourth thing that happens in the Internet of Action is you can animate both objects and environments. Of course, it's the Internet of Action. And what, what does it really mean, animating objects? It means you can call upon AI from anywhere, anytime. In the future, your phone will be able, it already does that but it will be able to do it on demand and depending on what you need, your phone will connect to very powerful AI systems to reconfigure itself to give you a service or a solution to what you're looking for. We're not, lo we're not looking at machines that you need to program to do things where you need to have applications we're looking at machines that configure themselves automatically, autonomously, depending on what you're looking for. Again, here are some visualizations of how the world, the augmented world of ambient technologies could look like. These are some screenshots taken from a video by Keiichi Matsuda, who is a Japanese artist who lived in London. And he makes these provocative videos of how the future could look like, the future of media. Okay, so here you see a scene of shopping where you see your virtual assistant that appears giving you assistance. You have all the advertising spaces, which is digital. You have a, a, the, the virtual mascot on your shopping cart. And here is how the, the street could look like immersed in media. So here immediately you see how important it will be to filter content as you go along because you'll have devices that allow you to see anything, anywhere, anytime. So you need to filter a bit, otherwise things will get very chaotic as you can see. I'm finished, I'm gonna leave a couple of minutes for questions. This is of course an autonomous car. As you can see, and again, examples of visualizations in ambient technologies. So we saw in this part, in this last part, okay, about animating objects and environments. We have infusing technology, getting AI on demand when we need it to do things, to solve things for us, anticipate our needs and behaviors. This is already happening in shopping. Visualize, as you can see, visualize con digital elements around yourself constantly, and orchestrate different types of technologies to come together and give you a particular type of service, okay? So, four things in the, in the future of Internet of Actions. I'm gonna leave you with that, and I'm gonna leave five minutes for the questions, okay? Thank you. We have 10 minutes for uh, some questions. Uh, 
Uh, you have to you have to put the questions at the micro microphone. I come with the mic. Can I? It's nice being here to do this. Hey, it's like being in a TV show. Hi, what's your name? Where do you come from? <laughs> uh, what's your view on self driving cars? Uh, it's like the thing right now to get you to the garage to your team. Thank you. So the, the question is, what's, what's the view on, on uh, autonomous vehicles? The, I was having this conversation the other day, and uh, uh, so <clears throat> it's going to be a big problem because essentially, as you have seen in the past years, we've been investing in infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, like high-speed trains, okay? Not only the streets, but you know, in, in, trans in mass transportation media like airports and so on. The problem is that in the long-term future, uh, and I'm going to get to autonomous transportation. Don't worry. Uh, in the in the long-term future, um, flying is going to be very hard in a lot of geographical areas and very unstable due to geographical issues like weather, climate change. Is going to look at some areas already uh, that are hit by tornadoes, typhoons during certain months of the year. You can't fly there. And this is creating already problems. Okay, so one thing. Two, autonomous vehicles are coming out. So autonomous vehicles can come, pick you up at home, take you wherever you are. You can have a new concept of car that is really a living room with wheels because you can sit comfortably, you don't have to drive. So the view is, it will dramatically change the design of every vehicle we know, of every car we know. It will make instantly obsolete most of the transporta ground transportation systems, because why would you go to take a train that is, by the way, a very expensive infrastructure, where you can have a very, uh, uh, a car that comes to pick you up, you have an app, you call it whenever you want, like Uber. It's autonomous, comes to get you, takes you to wherever you have to go for your meeting. Then either waits for you or takes somebody else somewhere else. It's an eternal taxi that goes around, never gets tired, never stops. Imagine the fusion of uh, uh, the new types of battery, solar power, and autonomous. So you have never-ending autonomous vehicles that go around. So big disruptions. Obviously, drivers will disappear. And most of all, it will become illegal to drive at a certain point. So I'm not trying to scare you, give you a catastrophic view of things. It's just a change, a big change. It can lead to that because it will be so safe to be on an autonomous vehicle that it will make any human action behind the wheel unsafe, essentially. Because if you really analyze how we drive, we look at the phone, <laughs> the, all the things that we do every day that are dangerous, they will be prohibited. Another question, yes, come on. So the, the, there is a phenomenon that's called uh, screening. You may have heard of it, which is essentially placing screens everywhere. But, and the next, the next thing is immersing ourselves in computing or wearing glasses that enable us to see augmented reality elements around us. Uh, today, essentially, you've seen many examples of augmented reality glasses, VR glasses. Uh, I don't understand if the question is when will they be there or okay so <laughs> that's a tough question so they would pay me a lot of money if I knew the precise answer but and I wouldn't be here with you <laughs> I don't know. Uh, just kidding uh, so I would say in a couple of years they will be used a lot consider that in in about a year and a half 
we went from the original HoloLenses, which really had a small screen inside the glasses. So it's not like you wear them and you see 360 degrees around you digital elements. You see them through like a, uh, like a square. Okay? It's like a screen inside the glasses. Okay? So it's not really nice. So to go from that to uh, uh, a bigger one, okay, which is essentially in front of you, a square, bigger square in front of you, it took a year and a half. And it's still a device that costs, I think, three thousand more or less, two two hundred, two thousand five hundred dollars or something. There is the Magic Leap one that came out, again very limited. So now don't look at the videos you see on the internet; it's all fake. If you have a guy coming from California like me telling you don't believe him, because you know it's <laughs> California, we say a lot of things. No. Um, it will take a couple of years. There is another thing happening, not in augmented reality, in virtual reality, which is the new headsets from Oculus, the Quest, which represent a real breakthrough for two reasons. One, they connect via Wi-Fi directly to the internet, you don't need a computer. Two, they're cheap, because they're cheap, they're around, uh, well, depends on the pockets, but $400 is less than a high-end phone, okay? So the Oculus Quest is really the first example of head-mounted computer. It's really something as powerful as an iPhone 10 put on your head and in front of your eyes. You, can, you have cameras that allow you to see outside. So you can be in a VR space and also see outside. Okay? So this is also coming, it just came out. So, and it's driving mass adoption because it's more accessible, easier to use. Okay. And these are really the, the next three years, I would say, are really the years where VR and AR are going to hit adoption. And if I can grab a minute before the next question, there is something uh, uh, quite interesting I think you should know at this point on this. I told you about screening, but computing has done and uh, has done a strange, uh, there has been a strange dynamic in the evolution of computing which is, first, we created computers that we put in a room far away, uh, kept cooled in the basement, which is the server room. Remember, the first computers were huge machines in, in a, locked in a room. Then the computers came onto our desks. They, they, they came towards us, closer to us. They came on our desks. Then they wanted to come closer to us, and they came onto our bags because we invented portable computers. After portable computers, they went not anymore in our bags, in our pockets. So they come closer and closer to us. Now they are in front of our eyes. And for the first time with virtual reality, we're changing this paradigm of computers coming to us. But for the first time, we are entering the world of computers. Because once you wear a headset, you are surrounded by digital, a digital world. You're not surrounded by the physical anymore. So it's for the first time computers be, got so close to us that we are going inside of them. Okay? Yeah? No? I'm, I'm, my time is up. Don't worry. I, I, I shut up in two minutes because they kicked me out. So. <laughs> Sorry. Can I take a question? This is all very exciting, but my question is, uh, what about, uh, I mean, is this uh, Internet of Actions for everyone, or uh, may someone be left out? This, is, this is actually applies to many technologies. Uh, I wouldn't say it's related to the Internet of Action. I would connect this question a lot to AI. So. Having no AI in the future will be like having no wheels today or something. Okay? So uh, the real issue is that while we are pro progressing so fast in technology in the Western world, there is the majority of the world which is really left behind. And I'm not making the usual uh, uh, speech, on, I mean, uh, conversation on uh, poor people or the problems. I'm talking about a serious imbalance that has become unsustainable. And AI 
in my opinion, will greatly increase this divide. Because on one way, we're, we're decreasing digital divide, as we say. We're, we're up, uh, uh, making more and more people adopt technology. And on the other way, we're creating a new, smarter wave of technology, which will be accessible only to a few people. Already today, if you want to use the full power of AI in the compute, computing brains of Microsoft, Apple, Google, and the big ones, you have to invest a lot of money if you are a company that wants to leverage AI. So either you have access to it or you'll be left out. The problem is that when you have AI, your performance jumps like 100 times ahead. And the, the others are really left behind. So yes, big issue. No, no solution, I'm afraid. Not that I know of. But.